Hey everyone. Well, I owe you guys another video. The other video was cut a little bit short and I never did talk about what the next steps were for this engine. Um, I want to start by saying that there will not be any next steps on this engine until after the race that I'm going to be doing in June up at uh, Gingerman. Um, oh, well, there's farm equipment. <laughs> that wasn't expected. But that said, um, I still wanted to uh, collect some data at the drag strip and I wanted to go over it with you guys. So, uh, failing the ability to collect it at the drag strip, um, thankfully we can do some data logging on the street. We'll just have to do it in second instead of fourth. So we won't get as good a data, but it'll still be good data. So let's do a second gear pull. Uh, and you can see actually the uh, accelerometer right here. So we're in second gear, almost stopped, and full throttle. All right, so ah, we're back to a significantly quieter shop. Um, sorry about all that wind noise and apparently all that glare on the tablet screen earlier. Um, if you want a zero to 60, I tried getting one in there, but I put the best run at the end of the video. At this point, this car, it's, it's struggling on the street to get a good zero to 60. It just can't hook. Uh, in fact, you can see right here, this is from that tablet screen in first gear, uh, 0 0.97 G's. That was the best I could do, but that was still with a fair bit of tire spin. Um, and even in second gear right here, like it's not tire spinning, right? Cause I've got good tires here, but that's 0.77 G's in second gear. So um, yeah, it's, it's getting pretty violent on the acceleration at this point. Um, and keep in mind those numbers that I just posted. So that's coming from the, it looks like it's coming from the tablet, but right underneath the tablet right there, there's actually a podium connect module. So that's our telemetry module for when we're doing endurance racing. It sends our data back to the pits live so that we can provide feedback and whatnot. But uh, yeah, that's got a 20 hertz GPS on it and a proper accelerometer and whatnot. So it, those numbers are good numbers. And by the way, that tablet, it's in there for predictive lap times. So the Podium Connect module, beyond just sending data back, it also will show you your predictive lap time as you're going around the track so you can see which turns you're gaining or losing on your predictive lap time. It makes it so much easier to actually improve your lap times instead of just having you know a lap time at the end of the lap if somebody in the pits can be bothered to radio it in. So that's been really good to improve our, our driving. I would strongly recommend it. But none of that is what we're here to talk about. Uh, we're here to talk about the AR platform and how we're going to get more power out of it. And in order to make more power out of it, uh, first thing we have to do is figure out what's stopping us from making that power, right? Um, in the last video, I mentioned that what I thought was holding us back was the intake manifold because frankly, there's a lot of things that make sense, right? It doesn't make sense that a motor that's rated for 188 horsepower wouldn't be a limiting factor when we're making 241. Um, but it turns out it isn't. So let's, that second gear pull that I did at the beginning of the video, um, let's look at the data. And remember how last time I said I can only measure the restriction inside the intake manifold? Well, I, I forgot a big factor. Um, this ECU, this Haltech ECU, well, as well as any other ECU, but with the Haltech we can log it, it has to compute exactly how much air makes it into each cylinder so it knows how much fuel to inject. And we can log that. <laughs> and that then doesn't matter what RPM. We know how full the cylinder is. And if we're at 100% fill, then there's nothing to improve there, right? Like, even if the power is dropping, that's not a problem of getting more air into the cylinder. That's a completely different problem. And check this out. So right here, this is the chart. This is the air fill getting to the cylinder. Now, the units on this are percentage, uh, because telling you that 0.875 grams made it into the cylinder is not nearly as useful as telling you that the cylinder is 107% full. Um, and by the way, that's the peak number here. And, and that makes sense because the, the momentum of the air and whatnot, I, that's for another day if we want to talk about that. Um, 
but essentially this thing is hitting over 100% volumetric efficiency for quite a bit of its range. No matter what we do here, we're not going to get more air into the motor. Now we can see towards the end that drops off a little bit, but remember, right? So let me add something to this graph. You see, this is the manifold pressure that we had. So now we know, we know how much air is making the cylinders as well as manifold pressure. So if we put those together, we can know how much of the available manifold air made it into the cylinder. So that allows us to tell what the intake runners are doing. And if we do that, you notice that curve gets even flatter. So at this point, uh, and, and by the way, the end there where it drops off at, you know, over 7,000, that's the soft rev limiter starting to kick in. So ignore that little dip at the end. Um, I wanted to do an 8,000 RPM run at the drag strip, but on the street, I run into legality issues to be able to pull to 8,000 because 8,000 is 75 miles an hour. Um, so yeah, what we've got is a 7,000, uh, what we've got is a 7,000 RPM pull. We'll deal with it. But you see how that line is almost flat? Um, that's telling us that the air is making it through the intake runners and into the cylinders. Everything that's into the intake manifold is making it into the cylinders. Um, and we know we're losing about two and a half percent power between the air filter and after the throttle body, which is really good by the way. And then we're losing about another 3% to the intake runners at 7,000 RPM. And, and of course, we could eliminate those losses, right? That two and a half and that 3% by going to uh, open air trumpets without filters and individual throttle bodies. And for some applications, that makes plenty of sense. For endurance racing, it doesn't. I mean, <laughs> if you look at the car, right, you can see all the rubber that makes it on it. And sure, that rubber doesn't make it easily into the engine bay, but for a 20 some odd hour race, some of it does. And that's just not good for reliability. Uh, instead, I've got this massive air filter that's rated to something like a thousand horsepower and it just provides almost no flow restriction. Um, but what gives, right? So here's the dyno plot we got the other day. And you can see, right, we're losing at 7,000 RPM, our torque is down by about 12 and a half percent. So where'd the other 7% go? Um, well, we can eliminate the exhaust because if the air is making it into the cylinder, that means there's space for the air to get in there, which means the previous air made it out of the cylinder. So we don't have to worry about that. And that 7% is worth about 20 horsepower. Um, so some of it is lost to windage inside the engine. Uh, there's a bit of oil drag on the bearings and we're running a, a light 5W30 oil. So we can't really reduce the viscosity to, to drop that friction anymore. Um, but if we look at the construction of this engine, uh, here's a here's a cross section from Toyota. You can see, well, actually, let me go get it. So this is what's sitting in there. This is the balance shaft assembly. This turns from the crankshaft and turns these two balance shafts. And you can kind of see in there, um, see there's a counterweight, but that counterweight there, that edge, you see, that's chopping through the oil. This is sitting, <laughs> It's sitting below the oil line. Um, now, when it's running, the oil line goes a little bit lower because some of the oil's in the engine. So it's it's probably not technically sitting be below the oil line. Um, I, I don't have enough information to answer that, but this is about eight pounds and it's adding some drag. And this thing, keep in mind, this gear here is half the size of the gear on the crank. So that means it's spinning twice as fast, which, you have to for a harmonic balancer, but that means that we're spinning this thing, you know, at 8,000 RPM, 16,000 RPM. And the four journal bearings in here, they're just, they're naturally gonna see a lot of friction. So, so I don't know how much of the 7% is here, but some of it is here. And the power that the engine uses to turn this thing could instead be used to push the wheels forward. Now it's probably only five at most 10 horsepower of that 20 horsepower that we're losing. But I wouldn't say no to free five horsepower and eight pounds off the car. I mean, this car weighs less than 2000 pounds, so that makes a significant difference. Now, keep in mind, of course, um, balance shafts are there for a reason. They, <coughs> one of their primary reason is NVH, so noise, vibration, and harshness. A four cylinder engine has this second order harmonic and it, it just causes the whole engine to want to go up and down. And it's a lot more 
emphasize that lower RPM. So the lower they make these things idle to get better fuel economy, uh, the worse that that's going to get. So the more that you're going to see these big balance shafts on motors. On some motors, running without the balance shaft actually causes damage. Um, it probably won't on this one, um, but there's really only one way to find out. And this motor's actually got to come out one more time. The intake, I believe the intake VVTi actuator, possibly the exhaust, but probably the intake, is making some noise on cold startup, and I just don't want it to break during the race weekend. So that means the next race in June, I will be running without the balance shafts, and I'll be able to, you know, maybe it won't have been enough to cause damage then, but all subsequent races will be running without that, and I'll report back if there's ever an issue. Um, I don't expect that there's going to be an issue other than idle vibrations. Which, by the way, since this thing now idles at 1,000 RPM because of the cams, it's really not going to be that big of a deal. Um, if it goes down to its 650 RPM, it's going to be a lot more noticeable than at 1,000. But let's go to this dyno chart. So you can see that that power output just drops, right? Even though we're still getting air into the cylinders. Now, yeah, we don't know what's happening between seven and eight, but we can see that output is dropping. So what's, what's going on there? Well, another thing, that's, another thing that I noticed when I was tuning this thing is there's no knock anywhere. Uh, even if I got stupid with the timing, I lost power, but at no point did the engine knock. So that tells us that we don't have a high enough compression ratio. There's, right, this engine's designed to run on regular, we're running it on premium and just getting no knock at all. Um, so bumping this thing up from that 10.0 to you know, 11, 12, 12 and a half uh, would be a good idea. And each one of those bumps in compression actually produces a significant power increase. Um, if we went up to 12 and a half to pick a number, <laughs> there'll be a reason why later. Uh, you know, we'd be looking at picking up an extra 20 horsepower. So there's definitely something there. And the and the other thing too is at high RPM, if there's not enough swirl in the chamber, it might be causing the flame front to be able to, sorry, the piston to be able to outrun the flame front, which is why that torque's dropping off. Now, it's important to notice that the torque drop off is very much, it's exponential, but it looks like the exponent doesn't change. It's just kind of slowly dropping off. So it's not, it's not like we're losing valve control and things are sticking open or we're breaking down oil films and we're starting to drag against the uh, bearings. I think it's just something like that, like we're, the piston's outrunning the flame front, right? So we need better swirl. Like if we look a couple of videos ago, some of you guys might remember, the squish region on this engine is two and a half millimeters. That's really not a lot of squish for an engine like this. Uh, so some of that could be corrected. So that's where I'm at. Um, I don't think that I've hit the limit of the stock intake manifold anymore. Um, I think we need to increase the compression ratio and remove the balance shafts and see where that takes us. Um, I think that'll take us at least to 260, possibly even 270 wheel horsepower. Um, another way to look at it, I think, is the 1AR's displacement might be canceled out due to its lack of compression. Not that the 2AR FE had a lot of compression. That We went from 10.8 down to 10. But if we look at the AR family with the intention of Frankensteining something together, right? So we don't need as many custom pieces. We can find inside the family, there's the 2AR FXE. So that's an Atkinson cycle version of the two and a half liter motor. Uh, it has a 12 and a half compression ratio, right? Which probably is a good one to go to. And um, actually, let me go get the camshafts. I, I ordered some. So this is a normal 2AR cam and you can see you know it's it's pretty bumpy and if we look at the 2AR FXE we can see let's see do you see how much fatter those lobes are the way that Toyota's doing Atkinson well it's not just Toyota it's a lot of manufacturers <coughs> they're doing it by leaving the intake valve open after it's while it's on its compression stroke and what that means is these Atkinson motors have to have a very long duration intake camshaft. Now, also it's, it's not set up in a performance mode, right? So the intake, it's, it's really retarded. But if we look at how retarded it is compared to the regular one, compared to like the regrind I did in here, 
it's almost 20 degrees exactly. So if you just take this cam and you install it two teeth over, because there's 36 teeth on here, you're gonna end up going from an Atkinson cam to a high performance cam. Now, all that I was able to tell with Toyota's information sheets. What I couldn't tell is the amount of lift that the cam had, and that very much has an effect on the airflow. And I was pleasantly surprised. The FXE cam um, at the valve has 9.4 millimeters of lift, and the FE cam has 9.8 millimeters of lift. Uh, so 0.4 millimeters, yeah, it's, it's a difference, don't get me wrong, but it's not a huge difference. And what I'm running in here, by the way, is 10.3 millimeters. So again, you're looking at less than a millimeter or less than 40 thousandths of an inch. So, you know, for essentially zero dollars, in fact, these motors are cheaper. So for a discount, you can get a high performance intake cam. Now, here's the downside with that motor. In most places in the world, this is the exhaust cam in there. Now, if we look at this, the, <laughs> the lobes on this thing are just, they're minuscule. This thing's got a duration of something like, oh, I forget, it's like 220 degrees or so. And it doesn't have a whole lot of lift. And the other thing is, it doesn't have VVTI. Now, in some parts of the world, the 2AR FXE actually does have VVTI, but that's not common. So what I think we've got here is a performance motor in disguise. If you take a 2AR FXE and you move the intake cam forward by two teeth, and then you replace the exhaust cam either with an exhaust cam from an FE motor, or I'm 90% sure um, that you'll be able to use that intake cam in the exhaust position. So you get another 2AR FXE exhaust, sorry, intake, and you put it in the exhaust position, then you're gonna have 260 degrees and 260 degrees and no need for any shims, right? Because the base circle on this cam is that same 38 millimeters that it's expecting. So all of the rocker geometry stays exactly the same. It's just simple. Drop the balance shafts off, assuming that we figure out that that's not actually gonna cause issues. And you've got yourself a motor that's with the higher compression ratio is probably gonna beat what this thing's putting out right now. Uh, now, this thing has probably more potential with more displacement, but I bet you that motor, that modified 2AR FXC will probably get at least 250 wheel horsepower, maybe even 260. So, but here's the downside with that. You see this on the intake cam? See this uh, little tooth, medium tooth, and long tooth? That's the cam trigger pattern. That's what the ECU uses to be able to tell where the cam is so it can position it properly. Well, by advancing it two teeth, you're gonna confuse the stock ECU, it's gonna get angry at you, and yeah, it, it, it's just gonna get angry at you and it's not gonna work. So that performance motor is gonna be relegated to an aftermarket ECU, no matter what. But again, you're saving so much money on the build that going to an aftermarket ECU, not as big of a deal. So for me, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do next. I'm not sure if I'm gonna pick up a 2AR FXE and do what I just said, or if I'm gonna put higher compression pistons in this thing, uh, which I would go to 12 and a half to one just to be able to stay as close to what the other options are as possible and just see how much knock it makes on premium fuel once the cam is moved, right? And I know what some of you guys are thinking, what about the 2GR FXE, right? Well, I looked at that thing. I've got cams on the way. I don't know what the lift is yet, but the duration on those intake cams is 270 degrees. It's even bigger than the two ARs cam. So I've got a set of those coming. Um, they'll probably end up in the Widowmaker. Uh, for grins, we'll probably try them with the stock 2GR exhaust cams. E either way, that's, that's for another video in the future, but I think there's some potential there for essentially a $200 upgrade to the 2GR. Uh, but again, it's not just a $200 upgrade because it'll require an aftermarket ECU. So, all right, that's all I have. Um, stick around if you want to watch the zero to 60 and uh, have a great day, guys. Bye. Zero to 60.